Good day and welcome to Followers. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was empty, a formless mask cloaked in darkness, and the Spirit of God was hovering over its surface. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. We are not the light, but we are most certainly reflectors of the light. And today we're going to talk about us as a conveyor of that light. Rick says, stained glass is a colorful metaphor for faith, the church, and our Christian witness. So today we explore our relationship with the light of God and see how we can share our testimony about God's love and turn our very lives into windows of opportunity. God didn't need to create a system where we, the broken, the lazy, the unreliable, were his messengers and reflectors of his light, but he did. It's on us, and so we renew our commitment to be ambassadors for Christ in this world.
Before we can be bright lights for our God, we have to acknowledge where the inner light comes from. The source of that light that consumes our darkness and changes us from glory to glory through His love and His word. There's always going to be a time when it feels like your inner fire for God has dimmed. Maybe it even feels like your whole pilot light has gone out. God knew that those times would happen and he created the church community to help us return to full glowing strength. When you feel like everything has gone dark, that's the time to move closer to the light, even if it's just in the reflected glow of a church.
2 Corinthians 4 makes it clear that God knows He is shining His light through very fragile vessels here on earth. But there's a wonderful reason why God chooses us, as weak and unreliable though we may be. Listen to today's reading. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever.
I'm sure there have been plenty of times when you definitely didn't feel like you're the reflected light of Almighty God. When that happens, it's best to talk to your dad about it. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking you to take away distractions and help us to focus on the truth of your word. We thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you for your leading and guiding us by your Holy Spirit. It says in your word that you are the light and in you is no darkness. If we walk in God's light, we experience a shared life with one another and through Jesus shed blood, we are purified. The natural outflow of life with you is true, authentic, self-sacrificial love, and the world will recognize that we are followers of Christ by the love we have for one another. Lord, fan the fire within us so that others will see your beauty. May we not hide the light, break down barriers, use us with all our faults and failures, giftings and personalities, stretch us and choose what is best for us. May we walk daily in the middle of your will, which is the best and safest place to be. Like Jesus, with Jesus, and for Jesus, may we want to walk in the light. Let our light shine before others, that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. And that is what we want today, that you be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. This world is not a happy one right now. It's unsettled and divided. There's danger from the weather, wars, and willful, evil people. Sometimes it seems like our best hope is to go home with Jesus as soon as possible. There's an important lesson in there, though. We need to be constantly reminded that this is not our home. We don't require or get a perfect world here because we're going to a perfect world next. Sometimes at night when I am afraid Cover my eyes and I cover my shame. So here in the dark, broken apart, come with your light and fill up my.
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness because you'll have light that leads to life. His light was strong and unwavering and drew sinners to himself and changed lives. But some of the religious leaders preferred darkness to light. They mounted a campaign to extinguish the light of the world, thinking that killing him would snuff out that glory and the light would no longer expose them for who and what they were. But the light was merely dimmed for a few moments as the sins of the world were heaped upon him and then he blazed back in victory. And all of us have had that veil removed so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. All around us are those blinded by Satan and unable to see the glorious light that is ours, the light that is shining all around them too. They don't understand the message of God's glory and grace, but we do. And we say thank you. For the God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made us understand that this light is the brightness of the glory of God. While others are blinded by the gods of this world, our lives are to be living testimonies to the very radiance of our God. And it's not enough to love the light. We need to allow the light to shine in every corner of our lives and illuminate the lives of our family and our neighbors. And we need to reiterate our gratitude, which we do at communion. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for sending the light of the world to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And thank you for the emblems of communion that we get to share whenever we're together. And even if we are digitally connected, bless the emblems of communion that anyone has with them today and help us to know that we walk in your light. Amen. There is a candle in every soul Some brightly burning and some dark and cold And there is a spirit who brings a fire Ignites a candle and makes his own Carry your candle Run to the darkness, seek out the helpless, confused and torn, and hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle and go light your world. Take your candle. Frustrated brother, see how he's tried to light his own candle some other way. See now your sister, she's been robbed and lied to, still holds a candle without a flame. So carry your candle. Whose hearts are blazing 
So let's raise our candles and light up the sky. Praying to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us a beacon in darkest times. My blessing this week for you is to move closer to the eternal light of Jesus in assurance of his love and never-ending power. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? Be blessed this week. Stay in the light. And now here's Rick with his visual sermon called Evangelism. Windows of Opportunity. Stained glass has been a window into faith and spirituality for a millennium. in the time before there were churches and before there was electricity. When things got dark at night, it was a pretty tough environment to live in. Bad things happened to people at night. There were a lot of wild animals. There were a lot of predators. People would be predators on other people. So darkness was always equated with evil. It still is. So let there be light. Sitting atop the highest hill in the American capital is Washington National Cathedral, the sixth largest cathedral in the world. Thanks to its 200 stained glass windows, it has a global reputation for its magnificent light a light meant to bridge the physical world and the spiritual. The windows create intricate patterns, and if you watch them long enough, they move because the sun is moving. The light follows the sun. That is just one reason why stained glass windows are a wonderful metaphor for us. We follow God's Son, and if people watch us long enough, they'll see Him at work through us. 
It reminds me of a story that I heard as a young minister that has stuck with me for years. It's about a little boy who grew up in a church with various stained glass windows depicting the saints. One day in Bible class, the teacher asked, what is a saint? And without missing a beat, the little boy said, a saint is someone the sun shines through. Precisely. Only in our case, it's the S-O-N. So let's begin with the principle that we are a window through which the light of God shines to reveal His glory. And that's been happening for a very long time. Though stained glass was likely first made by the Egyptians more than a thousand years ago, the art reached its highest point in the Middle Ages, from the 400s to the 1400s. This is one of the earliest surviving pieces of stained glass, made in the late 600s and found in an English cathedral. It's simple, but beautiful. But it was in Paris where the abbot of a cathedral first came up with the concept in the 1100s that the interior of a church should be otherworldly and spiritual, bathed in a light not of this world. He felt that light could remind people of their savior and their connection to something far greater than themselves. But there was another reason for the rapid development of the windows. At the time, 80% of the population was illiterate and printing had not yet been invented, so hand-copied books were rare and expensive. But stained glass allowed people to see the stories of the Bible come alive in full color. So priests and pastors used the new art form as a teaching tool to illustrate higher truth. It's impossible for us to understand just how astonishing and moving that would have been for people who lived drab, dreary lives without much color, education, or entertainment to break things up. The windows inspired awe and faith, a sense of wonder, and a stunning visual reminder of Scripture's most important messages. And these days, Bible illiteracy is the highest it's been in generations. Most people know almost nothing about faith, Jesus, or how God wants us to live our lives. So our job is to show them with love, humility, and gentleness, letting those things shine through us as the light of God permeates our lives. We are to be a window through which God can reveal His glory for all to see. We're a bridge between this physical world and the spiritual one. Like the stained glass windows in cathedrals around the world, each of us may have different styles and different stories, but we convey the same powerful message. God is love and light, and we're called to live a life of the same love and light. Jesus said, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. But it's not just about your good deeds. Think of your life as a mosaic of light and dark, with strengths and weaknesses, good times and bad, and periods of obedience and rebellion. When we learn from all of that, Put the pieces together in a way that glorifies God for His grace and forgiveness, and then bless others with our insight and experience. Even our bad deeds from the past form a beautiful picture of redemption. It reminds me of Paul who said, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me, so Christ could use me as a prime example of His great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize they too can believe in Him and receive eternal life. This next point may seem a little obvious, but it's one we don't often think about because it's so obvious. It's only when the light shines through us that the radiance of God is shown. Without the sun, a stained glass window is dull and lifeless, seen from the outside. Such windows are plain and unimpressive, with only a hint of the beauty within. That's because they're not designed for a focus on the exterior. 
and neither are we. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, says 1 Samuel 16, 7. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, that what's in the heart will come out in the way we live. We will never be able to transmit the light of God if there's darkness within, or if we try to convey our faith through our own righteousness and talent. Without God shining through us, people will never experience His radiance and majesty. As John writes, the Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. But that light needs a conduit, and that's you. But we have to remember that each part of a stained glass window is insignificant by itself and that all the pieces must fit together before the splendor is seen. Essentially, each window is a mosaic pieced together by three artists, a designer, an artisan, and an installer, each of whom have different gifts and areas of expertise. And they are a fitting metaphor for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To illustrate, Consider the West Rose window in the National Cathedral, often considered the most beautiful window in all of Christendom. It was inspired by creation itself after designer Rowan LeCompte found himself meditating on fall leaves. Some in shadow and some in full sunshine and some mysterious and dim and others just like trumpets and trying to make a design that said that. And it worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. <laughs> and this, is the, this is it. And the rose window is certainly special in my career, and it only happens uh, once in a thousand lifetimes to have a chance to be working on a rose window of that dimension. It's presumptuous to try to say, this shows, oh no it doesn't. This is a, uh, a meditation, you might say, just one person's meditation on the complexity of the universe. I can't, I can't, I dare not say more than just it's a it's an unknowing whisper in the dark but it's happy likewise our reflection of god will always pale in comparison to the full reality but our lives can still point people to him and our designer prepares us for that when a stained glass window is commissioned the first step is to draw a full-length version of the entire creation. It's called a cartoon, a name adopted by comic book illustrators and film animators centuries later. The detail and the perspective have to be perfect. It's not unlike how God designs us from the very beginning, with His vision of all we're intended to be. Once the cartoon is finished, it's sent to a master artisan who must translate the concept into glass and lead. Each piece is coded and numbered so it's clear where everything belongs. It's like how Jesus takes God's plan for us and builds us into His church, arranging us just as His Father wants. On a window, a pattern cutter is used to cut apart the pieces. It eliminates a sixteenth of an inch which is where the lead will eventually go to hold all the pieces together. Only in our case, it's love that cements us and holds the church together. The next step is to select the glass. What has the greatest influence on me is the medium, the glass itself. It's the liquidity. It, it is how the glass refracts the light with all its imperfections like air bubbles or ripples, it, is, it scatters the light. 
Yes, you heard that right. The flaws in the glass actually enhance its ability to reflect the light. It goes back to what I said about being transparent about our sin, so we can witness to God's love and forgiveness. In the traditional way, glass is fired in a kiln, blown into a big balloon-like cylinder, then cut. Then it's reheated in the fire to make the glass into flat sheets that are smoothed and made stronger. Once those sheets go back to the master craftsman, he follows the designer's pattern to cut each individual piece so it fits precisely, not too loose and not too tight. It reminds me of when Paul says, don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Once the raw glass is assembled, the panels go back to the designer who paints on the detail and puts in features to control the light. The glass is ground to the smoothness and softness of talcum powder, but the paint adheres beautifully. Then the panels have to be fired again to bake on the paint without melting the glass. In the end, everything has to fit and there's no room for error. Then comes the final assembly of the window. For that, the artisan makes his own lead strips which are shaped like an H with grooves on both sides the lead can fit into. Ultimately, the tighter the pieces fit, the longer the window will stay upright. And isn't that a great lesson for us? The tighter we fit together, the longer and better we'll stay upright. The last step is the delicate, difficult process of installing the finished window. But in most cases, that involves replacing old fixtures. So the old glass has to come out and the new glass must go in. Over time, stained glass gets caked in dirt and grime or it fades. You can really see the difference in this window where an old panel is sandwiched between two new ones before it's replaced. That kind of renewal must happen spiritually as well. We need the Holy Spirit to cleanse and transform us to get rid of anything in our lives that stops the light of God from flowing through us. We need spiritual clarity, intensity, and integrity. Paul writes, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light produces only what's good and right and true. That's why scripture says, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And that legacy will far outlast us. Both Rowan LeCompte and Dieter Goldkuhl are gone now but their faith and work continue to inspire people and will for generations to come. Most people will not remember them, but focus instead on the power and love of God's story which they brought to life with their giftedness and service. May it be the same with us. So remember, you are a window through which the light of God shines to reveal His glory. But what's most important is the light not the glass. 
Without God, our faith is dull and lifeless. And like each part of a stained glass window is insignificant by itself, we must all fit together as God wants before His splendor may be seen. Even then, we'll need periodic renewal to make sure there's nothing in our lives interfering with the light. But the good news is, our faith and work will far outlast us and perhaps carry others into eternity. That means if you want people to see the light, you may have to be the window. So get the lead out. Be a window through which the love of God pours. Because if you are, people will see light through you. And if you're not, people will see right through you. But you can do this. God has gone to great pains to prepare you. So focus your faith and use His love to color your world.